Hey, this is Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And Scott Todd is out today, but that just means we get to go to our guests even quicker. So without further ado, our guest today is Kathy Longo. Now, if you don't know Kathy, she is a certified financial planner, a chartered advisor in philanthropy, which sounds really cool, like just a giver a certified divorce financial analyst, which sounds even cooler because let's face it, that's like a big part of the population. We don't even talk about that a lot and what goes on with that. With over 25 years of wealth management experience, she is the founder and president of Flourish Wealth Management, an independent boutique wealth management firm in the Minneapolis area. Before launching Flourish in 2014, Kathy worked as a wealth manager, financial planner, and firm manager at companies of varying sizes in both Chicago and Minneapolis. Kathy Longo, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm, I'm so glad that you uh, could take time to, uh, to talk to us about wealth management because, you know, in our niche, we're always about building wealth, passive income, but there's always places where um, we want to sort of round out those edges, if you will. And um, so I think it's really, you know, important to kind of uh, learn more about wealth management in these different areas and, and kind of, you know, go uh, a little bit deeper into it. So let's just kind of rewind the tape. What got you involved in wealth management? Well, I feel so fortunate. I basically stumbled across wealth management as a major. I, I say kind of way back when, back when I majored in wealth management at Purdue University, there were only about a dozen schools that had a major in financial planning. So I, I was an economics major, stumbled across this class called personal finance and couldn't believe you could do this for a living. I love the idea of helping people with their money. Wow. So by the way, you, I don't know if you knew this, but I graduated from IU. I'm a Hoosier. So now, oh. now the podcast is really going to get contentious. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. So what, what are some of the things that you see as problematic when you meet with a client? Yeah, you know, so I, one of the big things that I, I see with clients is that people are not talking en enough about money. So they really don't have a good connection to their own money story, where their money's, money can get caught up in emotions because money can be really emotional for people and people have a hard time talking about money. So I think that that's that blockage that helps them, it prevents them from moving forward with good financial decisions. So just emotionally getting caught up with it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look at like certain you know, avatars of emotional blockages, right? Mm -hmm. You might have, you know, the spender, yeah. the saver. Um, and then along that spectrum, what do you have in between? Like, what do you see is most common uh, that you see? You know, so I think, it, and, and that's, I think when you say the spender and the saver, and then you have them getting married to one another and, and what, what comes to be in that marriage as, you know, we talked about divorce or you did an intro that mentioned divorce, you know, affects so many people, but money can be rooted in fear, you know, fear of not having enough, fear of making the wrong decisions. It can be um, issues of control, trying to use it to control um, one another in a marriage. There's so many different, um, you know, it can be a sad, sad piece too. Sometimes money comes to us via like an inheritance, we lose a parent, um, a divorce, we go through this transition event. So there's so many more um, uh, emotions that, and everyone has their own money story. You know, you think about how you grew up and what are some of those early money messages you learned from your parents and how your parents treated money. You take those into, you know, your own adulthood and your own relationships relationships right scott todd you jumped on hey how's it going man hi scott so, hey, how are scott you? meet kathy we were, we were just talking about one of your favorite subjects oh yeah money money money's good yeah money's <laughs> good so um kathy is in wealth management scott okay and uh we might as well just pick on you pick on me yeah all right. In your relationship, because Kathy works a lot with couples, unfortunately, sometimes with divorce, who's the spender and who's the saver? Oh, uh, well, I would say, sadly, that I'm the spender. 
And I would say that my wife is a saver. She does not want to really spend money. Like I'm like, oh, we should do this. We should do that. So I think that I would fall into the spender category. So Kathy, how would you advise Scott and his wife to start a productive conversation about this Mm -hmm. so that they can build wealth yet at the same time, Scott can take more flying lessons. Uh Uh-huh. Um, So does the different styles get in the way of how you approach money and setting financial goals for for your relationship? Uh, No, because I would say that, um, so it's not like, it's not like I'm, um, hmm, we we save, right? So like we're on the same page as as like, we will save, we have a plan for that. I actually create the plan. So like Mm -hmm. I kind of manage the money. So I'm like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Here's how we're gonna plan. Here's what we're gonna do. But then at the same time, I filter in things that I want or that we want. Things that, you know, like, hey, we're going to go do this. And she's like, okay, we're going to go do that. Yeah. And so I think that that's okay. The piece that I love hearing is that you have a plan there. But I think with um, making sure what I'll see with couples is that there can be a plan, but maybe one person really knows the plan and the other one's not as in tune to the day-to-day workings of the plan. So then they might not hold the other person accountable for maybe some of their spending decisions. So making sure that there's some um, ground rules around spending decisions like, okay, anything over, is it 250, is it 500, whatever it works in, in your relationship that you kind of get buy-in from the other one. So there is still that accountability. But you said the number one thing, which is saving and having a plan. So if you can make those goals happen, you're well on your way to you know, a solid financial future. Yeah, you know, Kathy, you know what keeps coming up, by the way? Um, infinite banking. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a client send me a book about infinite banking and and using life insurance as a, as a vehicle to become like your own bank. Do you have, do you have any uh, knowledge on this or thoughts? About um, this? You know, not enough to be an expert. I, in, in that conversation, I tend to believe insurance as more of a, for a set period of need. I'm a bigger fan of term insurance. I don't um, subscribe to insurance as the greatest investment vehicle. I think there's other areas to look um, for investment, but insurance does play a role, um, especially while people are still building their assets or they need some immediate liquidity. Um, that's what I think insurance has, has a better role for people. Okay, great, great. Um, Scott, do you know anything about infant banking? You know, Mark, we've had a couple of uh, guests on our podcast that have kind of like, uh, you know, talked about how it's the greatest thing ever. And, you know, um, I don't know. I'm just, I, I've done some research on it. I'm not that necessarily versed in it. I'm not an expert in it, but I tell you that it's not something that's ever really caught my attention. Like, you know, you got the, you know, you're obviously buying life insurance policy. You're, you're doing the, uh, the cash withdrawal on it so that you can go do your investments, banking, you know, your own loans, whatever. But I don't know. I'm just not, um, to, to me, you're, you're paying fees that I don't know that you necessarily want to like, I don't know. I think that you got to look at it for each person individually. For me, I'm not sure that the fees would kind of justify it. Right. Right. So Kathy, what's some of the worst advice you see or hear given in your area of expertise? Um, oh gosh, there's so much, so much bad advice and, and there's so much secrecy because, you know, there, there's a lot of like keeping up with the Joneses and assuming that, well, we should be able to do this because, you know, our neighbors, you know, they're doing this. Why can't we do these big trips or buy these, um, really big cars? Um, so it, it's, um, I feel like people take advice with lack of information. So they're, they're basing their own financial decisions on what they're seeing, but not with a solid education or understanding of, of, of what their goals are. You know, so I, I think that that's a, a mistake. And, and I really do think it, as we kind of started our conversation, it's rooted in not having enough money conversations. You know, I think that people should be talking to their spouse, to their parents, understanding what their financial, their parents' financial picture is and how that might impact them, to their kids, making sure that their kids are being prepared to deal with money. And even with our friends, you know, even conversations like this can start to encourage one another on what are you doing on your finances? And, you know, come up with some great ideas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I want to talk a little bit about divorce mm-hmm. because um, if you ever, are, if you're a fan of Shark Tank, 
um, you know, Kevin O'Leary wrote a book and um, one of his, his things was, you know, one of the biggest financial um, decisions you'll ever make in your life is marrying your spouse. Because if you don't, if you don't get that right um, and you, or you don't have this sort of, you know, alignment financially, you are at risk of losing 50% of your net worth. Mm-hmm. And it's something that um, I don't know about you. I think it's, a, it's maybe a little bit of a taboo topic that a lot of people don't really discuss openly. So number one is what is a certified divorce financial analyst? And then number two is um, how does someone kind of help people through this messy part in their lives? Yeah. Um, so a certified divorce financial analyst is an in a individual who has um, oh, education and training and past um, test to be able to help people through the financial decisions through divorce because there's so much when you have when you go through a divorce you know you obviously think of an attorney to help you along with those decisions but attorneys might not have all of the financial expertise on all assets are treated differently so whether it's a retirement account to understand what that tax effect is to whether it's um real estate or land and um understanding um taxable accounts or roth accounts everything has a different tax impact and um, spousal maintenance is treated differently. And so it's really being able to put all of the numbers together, look at proposed settlements, really be able to help them understand the financial decisions um, as they're going through the divorce so that they're not, because again, speaking to emotions, you know, I've seen people want to rush into that final decision because it's uncomfortable having to, you know, be in this contentious environment. Um, you know, you're dealing with like, issues with your children and how best to parent them and how to separate the finances. And it's just a really emotional time. So having a level-headed financial person who knows all the ins and outs can be a great team player to have on that, in that divorce process. Wow. That's great. That's great. Scott, have you ever heard of anything like that? I've never even heard of anything like it. No, I I haven't heard of anything like that. Um, mm -mm. Yeah. So, um, well, hopefully Scott and I won't need your services. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> hopefully I don't need it. Yeah. But it goes back to like, when you think about if we were having more conversations as we were getting married and thinking about that right partner and understanding each other's values and history with money, we could potentially um, either come up with systems or get some of these conversations to, to make sure it's not a deal breaker because money issues is one of the top reasons that people divorce. So we should be starting to talk about them, maybe not on date number one, but you know, somewhere in those early, <laughs> earlier dates in terms of how we approach money. All right. Well, Scott and I have teenagers. So how would you advise our teenagers as they go into the dating world? What would be like the, you know, let's say it's date number four, date number five, what would be some, some questions you'd want to ask to sort of probe to see, do our values align? Yeah, you know, you can talk about, um, so th- these are kind of uh, oh, some general questions, but you know, oh, how, how do your parents treat money? Like, you know, do your parents talk about money? What kind of um, rules do your parents put around it? Um, what expectations, you know, depending if they're like heading into college, um, what, what are the, your parents' plans for college education and how did they approach it? Um, how do your parents treat credit cards? Um, you, you get a lot of like, oh, do you, are your parents spenders or savers? You, know, you can ha- start to have these conversations about like, what's your experience? Everyone seems to have like an earliest money memory or their you know first experience earning money. Hey, tell me about your first time earning money. And um, what's one of that earliest memory or what lessons did your mom or dad teach you? So there's lots of ways to approach it in like a fun way to learn about um, how they grew up with money and how they think about it right now and then as you get a little bit older you know hey what's your credit score let's let's reveal um let's run our credit reports together and kind of see what's out there because I, i've had couples come up and um run that and find some big surprises where they didn't realize the person they were with had run up you know thirty thousand dollars of debt like credit card debt wow that's uh that, these are really good questions i'm, I'm going to save this <laughs> or, uh, yeah. And student loans too. You know, you think about the challenges kids coming out of college right now with a lot of debt, um, that is going to impact them going into relationship, being able to potentially buy a house together, 
be able to even invest in the near term as if they're having to focus so much on paying down that debt. So it's not to say that you rule out people with a lot of debt, but you need to go in with eyes wide open. I agree. Great. So, so Mark, I have a question. Like, at, at your family and your in your household, like, how freely to your children do you discuss like income? You know, like oh, money coming in the door. Like, is that is that a normal piece of your conversation, or is that like a taboo subject with with your family? I I don't really discuss it openly with the kids. Um, you know, I I do sort of. Uh, you know, cause I'm a big reader. I give them books all the time that they, I don't think they ever open, but maybe they'll thumb through. So, um, I think they know, you know, just through osmosis, how I feel about money. Um, you know, I'll always talk about, you know, saving, saving, you know, when it comes to college, look, we've been saving since you were born, right? We have a 529 plan. Um, every single month, mom and I, automatically save right um but other than that we don't talk a lot about income and certainly um you know my oldest works and if he wants something he's got to he's got to buy it uh for the most part yeah so so like what i what i've started doing is because like in before i before i did land full time like i didn't talk salary was off the t table. Like we, we didn't talk about it, but obviously the kids knew, Oh, we're doing well because you know, we keep getting, you know, we keep moving. Dad keeps getting promoted. <clears throat> no problem. But then what I started doing really with, really with my daughter, because I think she gets it. She, she has a job now. And so she, she knows like, man, this is what I make an hour. So the, the mere fact that I like, by, by a hundred dollar pair of shoes. She's like, holy cow, that's 10 hours of my, my working or whatever it, it works out to be. Right. So, so now all of a sudden she puts a value on things that are, that are being purchased. You know, like she's, she's equated to how long she has to work. So now what I've started doing Mark is I started taking, um, you know, like a, a daily glimpse or, you know, like for, for example, we went, we went to a uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers football game a few weeks ago. And, you know, while we're sitting there, I like get in my phone, I scroll down and like the email refreshes and I'm like, oh, look at this. I just made like $1,200, you know, for $1,200 just came in. She's like, stop it. You know, but I'm trying to show her like, look, the, the money just doesn't show up, right? Like you, you have to really command your soldiers, your, the money that you save is your soldiers. And so the more soldiers or the more employees that you can put out there to work, and then you go deploy them to go bring you back more money. Like that's the way I, I see money. And so I try to educate my children on the fact that, look, you, uh, you got to work for money, right? Like you got to, in the beginning, you've got to build wealth and no, no one's just going to come and ring your doorbell and throw money at, your, at you. But the more assets that you can buy land for us that will bring more of these dollars back for you, it becomes a genius thing. And so now all of a sudden her, her mindset shifted to say, wow, I'm keeping some money in savings, but how do I deploy that to go get a bigger yield on my money? So now we're having the conversation of yield and, you know, IRR and loans, you know, and, and all of these conversations that I never really figured, I never had with my parents, but now at 18, she's getting like the benefit of, of that piece. And I got to believe, you know, like she's motor, she's, she is excited now to start her, start investing her money with the dedication that she's going to put these, th these dollar bills to work and they're going to go work for her for the rest of her life. I think that's kind of a cool transformation. That, that's really cool. Kathy, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's awesome. I think you're, you're normalizing the conversation. You're using everyday experiences and your experience of being an investor um, to put that into just a, that's part of life. You know, so you're thinking about opportunities of how to make your money work harder and you, know, you can use it even in like spending choices too, because you know, it's investing and you know, how do you look at spending choices or whether it's okay, these are our goals for the year, you know, what you're looking to achieve and you know, 
do periodic updates, whether you're doing your tax return and talk about like what the tax return, um, you know, have to give like the specifics of the numbers, but all of, all of the stuff that we do that is related to finances, we can just normalize the conversation and say, oh yeah, I just, you know, sent in money to my retirement plan, or I was looking at the um, medical benefits or we're changing this. Um, this is how I think about it. You're, you're creating an opportunity for her to, you know, ask questions, absorb that information. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great. So Kathy, what are some of your most gifted or recommended books when it comes to wealth management? Yeah, you know, so I, you know, there's a, I love a whole bunch of them. Um, one would be my own book that I just wrote, which is Flourish Financially. And that book is really written. It's not um, the nitty gritty of the money and how, how that all um, needs to play out, but it's, um, it's thinking about your values, your history with money, all of the key transitions to plan for in life, whether it's retirement, career, um, death, divorce, and then getting ready for all those conversations with people. So I think that that's a great like overview um, that's missing where a lot of uh, what I saw in more of the investing books are a little bit um, Oh, more focused on um, just the nitty gritty of the numbers and how those work. And for some people, that's not their first approachable book um, to to understanding their own thoughts about money. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So we're at that point now, Kathy, where we're going to ask you for your tip of the week. I think your mentorship has been great, but now we're going to ask you for one more tip, a website, another book, yeah. a resource, something actionable for the Art of Passive Income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? Yeah, so I, I'm going to send them to a financial readiness test. It's an assessment that can be found on kathylongo.com, K-A-T-H-Y-L-O-N-G-O.com. Right when you open it, you'll find it. But it's just a nice overview that'll score um, where you're at in terms of your financial readiness for success. Nice, nice. Scott, I mean, you jumped on. Should I even ask you for a tip of the week? Oh, I'm ready, man. I, I'm You're excited ready. about it. Ready? <clears throat> so, like, this, this is one that, um, I mean, I don't know that we've ever talked about it, but man, I'm really um, been using this and I really like it. It's, it's called privacy.com. Privacy.com. And what that is, is it's basically, um, it's basically a, a website that you can go to. You link it to a bank account. And you can literally go there and create credit card numbers on the fly that's linked back to your uh, checking account. So basically what this does is, let's just say that, you know, you've signed up for a free trial somewhere and they want a credit card. And you're like, I don't wanna forget about the free trial and canceling and all this other stuff. You go on there, you put a limit. You say like, hey, a dollar, two dollars. Well, then you, you give them this credit card number and you can make it a single use or dedicated to a specific party. And then what happens is, you, you know, it's, it goes on there, it does the free trial, but because it's a single use credit card, they can't charge you again. It's over, it's gone, it's gone. And you can try it out and not have to worry about, about it. And if you wanna continue using it, great. You can put in a real credit card number or go back into privacy and create, um, a credit card that is dedicated to that specific person. So, you know, with all these credit card hacks and everything like that, man, it's, you know, you don't have to worry about your data being exposed. If, if Amazon gets exposed, you just go kill the Amazon credit card or a credit card that you're using through privacy, you nix it. And it's really, really good for VAs too. You know, like, Hey, you, you need a VA to go do something for you. No problem here. Here's a credit card number. They use it one time. Like I, the other day I put a, um, I put a, uh, my son wanted, my son wanted to order a pizza and I didn't want to give my credit card number to him. And so I'm like, here, I got a credit card number for you. So I go there, I put a limit of $30, one time use credit card number. I text it to him. He goes and he spends like $20 on a pizza and it, it, it's done. The car, $20 and it's gone. Like it didn't even go up to the $30. It's not like he had $30 to spend. He used it one time and whatever balance was left was there. So think about that in terms of, um, you know, giving something to your VA or something. Wow. This is phenomenal. And it's free. It's and free. It's free. Right. Kathy, what do you think? 
I, I think that's a great idea. It, and especially with cybersecurity and safety right now, that's an awesome way to go about dealing with your um, online identity, credit card numbers. Well, I wish I knew about this years ago. I've been a, a identity theft victim for years now. Hmm. Um, in fact, the guys, I keep getting things like the guy's going to jail. Um, Jeez. Yeah. Uh, in Mojave County of all counties. Isn't that funny? That's funny. So my tip of the week is learn more about becoming wealthy, um, getting your emotions in check about money. Go to flourishwealthmanagement.com. Learn more about Kathy and how she can help you. Flourishwealthmanagement.com. I have a, a link uh, to that as well. And, um, you know, I do want to remind the listeners, the only way, the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Kathy Longo from flourishwealthmanagement.com is if you do us three little favors, you got to subscribe, you got to rate, you got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 Passive Income Launch Kit course. So please do that. Um, it really helps. Also, if you haven't checked out the book lately, uh, Dirt Rich on Amazon is still available. Please leave a review. It always helps as well. Uh, also, just while I'm plugging away, check out Scott Todd. Give him some love. Go to scotttodd.net, landmoto.com. And most importantly, if not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Kathy Longo, are we good? We're great. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much uh, for sharing. Uh, Scott Todd, are we good? Mark, we're great. All right. Well, I want to thank the listeners again. I want to thank Kathy Longo. And let freedom ring. ring. Thanks, everybody.